In this video, we will talk about data collection and experimental design. We will discuss how to distinguish between an observational study and an experiment, and how to create a sample using random sampling, simple random sample, stratified sampling, cluster sampling, and systematic sampling, and how to identify a bias sample. So an observation study is where a researcher observes and measures characteristics of interest of part of a population. For example, researchers measure the amount of time people spent doing various activities such as paid work, child care, and socializing. So all they did was observe this and make note of the time. A treatment is an applied is applied to part of a population called a treatment group and responses are observed. Another part of the population may be used as a control group in which no treatment is applied. The subjects in both groups are called experimental units. In many cases, subjects in the control group are given a placebo, which is a harmless fake treatment that is made to look like the real treatment. So all of this is done in an experiment. Okay, so as you can see, in an observational, st observational study, you just observe the participants, whereas in an experiment, you apply some type of treatment, and then you observe the outcomes. So let's look at this example. An experiment was performed in which overweight subjects were given the artificial sweetener sacralose to drink while a control group drank water. After performing a glucose test, researchers concluded that sacralose affects the glycemic and insulin responses in overweight people who do not normally consume artificial sweeteners. So as you can see, a treatment was applied here. They were given this artificial sweetener and they looked at their, uh, their sugar levels at that point. So let's look at some examples. We're going to determine whether or not each study is an observational study or an experiment. Researchers study the effect of vitamin D3 supplementation among patients with antibody deficiency or frequent respiratory tract infections. 70 patients receive 4,000 IU of vitamin D3 daily for a year. Another group of 70 patients received a placebo daily for a year. So in this case, this will be considered an experiment. And the reason why this is an experiment is because a treatment was applied. And the treatment that they applied is the vitamin D3. In this next example, it says research, researchers conduct a study to determine how confident Americans are in the economy. Researchers called 3,040 U.S. adults and asked them to rate current U.S. economic conditions and whether the economy is getting better or worse. So in this one, this is an observational study. There's no treatment applied. They're not trying to sway someone's answers. So this is an observational study. So it does not attempt... to influence responses. They just asked the questions and recorded what the person said. Okay. So now let's talk about different sampling techniques. A random sample is where every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. You can also think of this as a simple random sample. Every possible sample of the same size has the same chance of being selected. Um, you can think of simple random sample. I used to be a big sweepstaker. I used to enter sweepstakes. And sometimes in the grocery stores, they will have drop boxes where you put your name in the box. And um, you, if they pick your name, you win a prize. So that's a simple random sample. Everybody in every piece of paper in the box has an equal chance of being pulled. Okay? And you pick one out 
or whoever, however many prizes you have. I used to go for uh, grills, Weber grills. So um, I put my name in the box, and then they randomly pick people to win three grills. Another way you can do simple random sample is by a random number table or a software program or a calculator. Um, what you'll do is you assign a number to each member of the population. Members of, members of the population that correspond to these numbers become members of the sample. So here's an example. There are 731 students currently enrolled in STATS at your school. You wish to form a sample of eight students to answer some survey questions. You're going to select the students who will belong to the sample random sample. So what you'll do is you'll give each number, each student a number, one up to 731, since you have 731 students. And you can use a number, uh, it's a number table, a random number table. And it has just random numbers. So here's an example of a random number table. And you know that you have to go by threes because the highest number has three numbers, 731, that's three numbers. So what you do is you can start anywhere on this uh, random number table. You just pick a random spot and you go by threes. So we know that we can pick from one all the way up to 731. Any number higher than 731 we cannot use because we don't have any students assigned to, to uh, any number over 731. So if we look at here, if we start here, we have 719. That would be our first number. Then you have 66 and you go over to 2. That's our second person that will be in there. 738 we cannot use because the highest number is 731. So we won't use that. The next one would be 650. Then we go by 3's again. We have 004. We'll just call that the number 4. The next one is 053, that would be 53. The next one is 589. Then you have 403. And the last one is 129. So I have my eight people. So those are the students. The students assigned to those numbers will be the ones that make up the sample. Another sampling technique is a stratified sampling method. Here you divide a population into groups and you call these groups your strata, your strata, and then you select a random sample from each group. So to collect a stratified sample of the number of people who live in West Ridge County households, you can divide the households into socioeconomic levels and then randomly select households from each level. So you can have a low income group, you can have middle income, and then you can have high income. So each one of these would be my strata. This is a strata, this is a strata, and this is a strata. And what you'll do is you're going to randomly assign, uh, randomly pick within each strata. So as you can see, I picked two here from the low income, I picked three here from the middle income, and I picked two from the high income. Now, a lot of students get uh, stratified sampling confused with cluster sampling. With cluster sampling, you do divide the population into groups or clusters, and you select all the members in one or more, but not all of the clusters. So going back to our West Ridge County example, you can divide the households into clusters according to zip codes. Okay? Um, so, you know, like a state, they all have different zip codes. And then you select all of the house code, uh, sorry, all of the households within that zip code. So here's zone one. These all have the same zip codes. Same thing for zone two, zone three, and zone four. So I can randomly pick a zip code and interview everybody in zone one. Okay. Another type of sampling is systematic sampling. And this is where you choose a starting value at random and then choose every kth member of the population. So going back to our example, you could assign a different number to each household and then randomly choose a starting number, then select every 100th household. So that's why systematic deals with kth, the kth number. So in this case, we're dealing with the 100th household. So let's say our starting point is the number 86. 
I want to choose every 100th household after 86. So we, we add 100 to 86 and we'll choose the household that's assigned the number 186. We add 100 to this, we get 286. So then we choose the household assigned to the number 286 and so on until we get the amount that we need for our sample. Convenience sampling you um, only choose members in the population that are easy to get. And this often leads to biased studies and is highly uh, not recommended. For example, if you wanted to do a survey on something and you just picked everybody that you live with, that's, you know, that's kind of biased. It's just something you got people who are readily available and you just go ahead and pick them. Okay, so let's look at these examples and we're going to determine what type of sampling technique this is. So this question is going, we're going to apply it to each type of uh, sampling method. So you're doing a study to determine the opinion of students at your school regarding stem cell research. Let's identify the sampling technique used. So you divide the student population with respect to majors and you randomly select and question some students in each major. Okay. So in this case, this looks like it's stratified. The majors would be the strata. And then you take from, you randomly sample from each one of the majors. Randomly select from each major. Okay. So I would consider this stratified. So if you got a major here, major here, let's say people here are majoring in English, this is math, and this is biology, and then you randomly select from each, each major. Those are your strata. Let's say you assign each student a number and generate random numbers. You then question each student whose number is randomly selected. So this is pretty much a simple random sample. So each student has an equal chance of being selected. Okay. This next one is you select students who are in your biology class. And remember, we're still talking about how to get samples for students who, and we wanted to get their opinion on stem cell research. So this is just taking, this sample is just taken from students in your class. And this is convenience sample because you, the, the students are there and you got access to them. So it's just easier for you to intervo, interview these people. Now this sample might be biased because these are biology students and they may be more familiar with uh, stem cell research than other students are. So they may have stronger opinions. So this would be biased. But this is convenient sampling. That's the end of this video.